The engine of America's greatness is not just its liberties, but the people's willingness to fight to keep them. Hundreds of other nations have had much larger populations and greater resources, but have never produced one-tenth of the wealth, science, and art that the United States has. Why? In America, you had an amazing situation because you had, you had the founding fathers who figured out that they could deconstruct the monarchy in such a way and then reproduce it with the three primary branches of government in a way that we create checks and balances and and separation of powers. So you could have room, therefore, for individuals to work within the context of a cooperative, which is a democratic system of government, but it would still have enough room for individuals to rise up and become profitable and self-sustaining and um, rich uh, in, in the pursuit of happiness without becoming dictatorial. Uh, but unfortunately, over the years, since all of those separation of powers have been cut away and all of the, the the beautiful design by the founding fathers has been co-opted by one corporate entity one corporate communist entity you don't have that anymore so what we have we're, we're back to where we were before the revolution you have one monolithic state for the first hundred years or so of the united states after the seventeen hundreds when we freed ourselves from uh, british rule no corporation was permit was given a charter in the united states unless it served the public good. It had to prove that. And then its charter only lasted for 10 years or sometimes as long as the project to build a bridge or a canal or something lasted. But it, it had to be up for review and it could only get charters if it, was, uh, if it was shown that it was serving the public interest. That changed primarily because John D. Rockefeller uh, kind of bribed Delaware and New Jersey to begin with into accepting a different system where he said, listen, if I pay you lots of money in terms of taxes, et cetera, uh, I want to be licensed and not have to serve the public good. I want to be able to get around that law. And state after state after state changed at that point. In the United States, our Constitution and Bill of Rights recognizes that individuals have innate freedoms that can never be taken away by any government. For the first time in history, the people were unbound to reach for their full potential, producing and outcompeting every other nation on earth. The rights of free speech, self-defense, private property, due process of law, and many others ignited a revolution in human development that threatened the despotic rule of monarchs and tyrants worldwide. But the corrupt elites had studied history. They knew that great civilizations could only fall from within. And they know from previous experience and history that civilizations come and go and dwindle. They know the reasons why they come and go. Isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Morty Strong, founder of the UN Environment Program, from his opening speech. Rio Earth Summit, 1992. Maury Strong is the man who said that uh, they would never allow another country to rise up as powerful as America. It will never be allowed to happen again. And he said the best thing we can do is to tear down all the factories, all the, the top commerce of the United States, and level it and give it back to nature. That, so that was the advice from this character, who has tremendous power at the United Nations and was picked up and groomed by Rockefeller himself. Over the past decades, since the Kennedy assassination approximately, you've had an ongoing oligarchical transformation of virtually every country in the world. And in the United States, it's taken the form of an oligarchical counter-revolution against the reforms of the 1930s, with the Wall Street interest asserting itself as more and more dominant. And once bankers and oligarchs have power, the things that they do, you could call them a policy, you could call it something like a tropism. It's like the way a plant responds. Naturally, since they're oligarchs, they're going to try to downgrade the standard of living of the vast majority of the population. They're going to claim that the world is overpopulated, that industrialization, industrial pollution, and overpopulation are the main problems that face the world and they're generally going to try to crush and mortify any kind of 
popular democracy or mass movements with any kind of progressive content. Nations rise and fall. Um, they knew how debt could never be recuperated. They knew that disease or, or prolonged war could wipe out the population and the future populations that pay off debt. So these guys all work together. That's why it's no surprise that today you have Lord Rothschild coming out, pushing the latest scam or religion that we must all believe in, which is global warming, which his personal bank, his family's bank in Switzerland, will be in charge of. They've run the system, the whole economic system of the world for the last two and a half hundred years. So why shouldn't they also run the economic system for the next few hundred years? The question of a ruling class, oligarchy as a ruling class, is posed by Plato in The Republic, where we find that oligarchy is a constitution full of many evils where the rich dominate the government by buying it and the average individual or the poor count for absolutely nothing. Oligarchy is a frame of mind. In other words, if you're a banker, this is already a world view. It's a world outlook, and it implies the policies that have got us here, right? Malthusian policies, zero growth policies, driving down the standard of living, attempts to wipe out all kinds of mass institutions that might be a countervailing force. This is a scientific dictatorship, which Bertrand Russell said, and the Huxleys said, both Aldo and Julian Huxley said, they would bring in the scientifically controlled society. It's not just family planning, which really means abortion and so on. It's global planning, which is, which is literally sterilization and abortion worldwide for the ideal reduced society. And not just across the board, through genetics, uh, through the genome projects, through uh, the constant IQ testing. Globalization has economically destroyed the world. You've got at least 40 to 50,000 people who die every day worldwide from starvation, malnutrition, and diseases which can be cured for pennies, such as diarrhea. And if you ask one of these Malthusian oligarchs, don't you think that something should be done to raise the standard of living in Africa or South Asia? They'll say, no, we can't do that. That would wound the planet. That would oppress Mother Earth. So that's oligarchy. Uh, class consciousness in this sense is absolutely essential. If you think that bankers are the same as you, you're wrong. F. Scott Fitzgerald once told Hemingway, you know, the rich are different from us. And Hemingway said, yeah, they have more money. And F. Scott Fitzgerald replied, no, it's something much deeper. It's a whole different world. To be an oligarch, to be a Rockefeller or something of this sort, uh, means that you're in a completely different world with values which are the reverse of human values. Now, if you allow the oligarchs to continue to dominate, the destruction of world civilization is a matter of a few decades at the very, very most. So, choose. To force their agenda through, the elites are employing one of their favorite tools, artificial crisis creation, also known as the Hegelian dialectic of problem-reaction-solution. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. The Earth's ruling elite are first and foremost monopoly men. The founder of the Rockefeller clan summed it up simply when he said, competition is a sin. Uh, Rockefeller himself said that competition was a sin. And people quipped at that thinking it was one of his little jokes. He made many jokes about saving pennies and stuff like this. But in reality he was telling you a truth that competition to a man like him, who worked for a much larger organization, competition truly was a sin. And the cartels that have been formed ever since uh, have become much bigger, more powerful cartels which can literally command governments, sometimes to go to war on their behalf, uh, have occurred. The economic crash of 2008 and 2009 was an engineered crisis designed to cripple sovereign nations globally to make way for a world currency and a new bank of the world. China is holding what? 1.5 trillion worth. All over the world, they're holding U.S. currencies. They want to get out of them in a way where they're not going to lose on their investments. There's going to be a world currency. There's going to be a new reserve currency. They're going to push it through the IMF. That's going to be the banksters 
that are going to be in charge of it. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen sooner rather than later. There was also a question to Geithner. Do you think that the U.S. dollar ought to be replaced? And he, he blew it. He had a moment of, uh, of candor where he said, yeah, we're, we're considering that. So on that day, the dollar went down 1% within a couple of minutes. A Chinese government proposal about a, about a global currency and about the IMF regulations, the new IMF uh, idea about you know, the general agreements to borrow and having a faster uh, ability to disperse to the large market. Uh, as I understand this proposal, it's a proposal designed to increase the use of the IMF's special drawing rights. Uh, and uh, we're actually quite open to that suggestion. Timothy Geithner's comments about global currency is not off the table because it's not off the table and it's going to come.